to be devoted to quantum computing. Now, please pay attention. Now, in a conventional model physics course, they just the chronological treatment of the development of atomic physics. And towards the end of the course, one learns about quantum mechanics. But we've actually turned the tables here. We've actually started the course with quantum mechanics. We've talked about wave functions. We've talked about fields to, to a certain extent. We've talked about the collapse of wave functions, uh, probability densities. Uh, we've looked at the measurement postulate. We've looked at interference. So we've this, we've covered a lot of ground in the first four or five lectures. And now we're in a position to actually start understanding what is a quantum computer. Because it's evident that because of societal pressures, because of economic pressures, but most of you would like to come to physics uh, as a major. Most of you would like to become engineers uh, and, or computer scientists. Some brave souls might end up in biology. And very few, and very few would actually end up in the most mundane and darkest of all subjects, which is physics. But I think every working scientist and engineer who comes out of Sayyid Babar Ali School of Science and Engineering must have an understanding of, of quantum computing. One must have an understanding of the Nobel Prizes in Physics over the past 20 years and what, what were the subjects of the Nobel laureates? What were the Nobel Prize winning works? If you walk out of a modern physics class and you don't know about quantum computers and you don't know about topological insulators and you don't know about laser cooling and you don't know about qubits, I think it's somewhat of a disservice. So that's why I decided to actually change the pattern of the course this year and involve some of these cutting edge areas uh, in the course so that you can actually understand what's going around in the world. And you can talk to scientists out there on a global arena. So in, in the next few lectures, which means the next four or five hours of this course, we'll actually be talking about quantum computers. And we do have the ingredients now at least I conveyed the ingredients that are necessary for an understanding of quantum computing and quantum information processing. Now, uh, just to motivate you, in the next five to 10 years, quantum computers are likely to become commercial. So there are three major initiatives that I would like to point your attention towards. One, okay, first of all, look at this image here. This is an image of a classical, conventional, large-scale supercomputer. Really large in size and it, it could be state of the art. But there are certain computational problems that even this computer might not be able to solve. For example, if one would like to find the prime factors of a number which is close to a million. The amount of time such a classical computer would take might exceed the age of the universe. So there are certain tasks which are computationally intensive, which certain classical computers cannot dare, cannot even attempt at solving within a reasonable time frame. So this is what a classical computer might look like. However, even though there are different variants of quantum computers, this is what a quantum computer might look like. Let me give you a clearer picture of So this is just one cutaway of a quantum computer. It looks nothing like a silicon Silico, silico classical computer that involves SRAMs and DRAMs and it uses a CMOS technology, nothing like that. It could look totally different. All right? So this is just one cutaway of a doer that houses uh, a quantum computer that operates at liquid helium temperatures. 
There are many more examples. So Google is now investing heavily in quantum computing research. Microsoft is investing heavily in quantum computing research. IBM is investing heavily in quantum computing research. And these are the, these are the two technology companies that I would like to point your attention to when I'll upload these web links or refer these web links to our website. First of all, you should look at quantum artificial intelligence, an initiative by Google. Uh, and there are certain publications here which could probably be Greek to all of us uh, at the moment, but nevertheless these pages can give you a good idea of, of the holy grail of achieving quantum supremacy. Then you should look up IBM. IBM's quantum, IBM Q is another initiative, a very large scale initiative by IBM, which, in which IBM would like to achieve quantum supremacy. And I'll explain what is quantum supremacy uh, in the next five to 10 years. This picture, <laughs> yeah, five to 10 years, fine. In the age of civilizations, five to 10 years is nothing. This work, by the way, has been ongoing for the past 20, 25, 30 years. This is an example of, of one realization of a quantum computer. It's a large tank, really large tank. You've seen some helium dewars outside uh, in the foyer area. So these are dewars which contain liquid helium. So this is a tank that has liquid helium in it, and it pulls a, an integrated circuit which has superconducting wires on it. And those superconducting circuits act as qubits. And I'm going to explain today what are qubits. You all know what bits are. I'm going to explain what's the Q in a qubit. And then you have a wiring coming out of this device and coming into a mainframe, classical computer, and you have a digital program that operates this, uh, this machine. And then this company <coughs> in San Francisco <coughs> called Rigetti, <coughs> is actually coming up with an open source Python based scripting language for quantum computers. So not all of us can build quantum computers because they are expensive, they are technologically advanced, we don't have the expertise. So Google and IBM will probably share their quantum computing hardware through the cloud. And users, registered users can log in, run their algorithms through the cloud on these hardware devices and actually perform certain tasks, certain tasks which are only amenable to a quantum computer. So this is a Python based language, uh, a package that Rigetti has developed, it's open source. So anyone can go on the web and look up these resources and learn these languages and learn these codes and can write quantum algorithms on your own. A physics student or a computer science student or even a biology student can do that. Not a big deal. So I'm just trying to sensitize you to the fact that these resources are now available and in the next five to ten years, by the time you graduate, probably commercial quantum computing would have become a reality. So just go to this website. Uh, this is a chip which houses a quantum computer, a multi-qubit quantum computer that goes inside that tumor, is kept at low temperatures, wired that are bringing in RF and microwave signals into this integrated circuit. You read off those signals and then do the processing on a digital classical computer. For example, just to give you a motivation, the computers that we use today cannot solve certain problems in a reasonable amount of time. If you were to find out the energy levels in a helium atom, which is the second most complicated atom, the simplest is hydrogen, just going to atomic number two or atomic number three, lithium, beryllium, just these simple elements finding out the energy levels tries, turns out to be intractable on a classical computer. You have to make certain approximations. So nature is quantum mechanical. Atoms are quantum mechanical, so if you would like to simulate these natural systems on a classical computer, it's really hard to do so. So you need another quantum device, which is quantum mechanical, 
which can simulate other quantum mechanical systems in nature. And that's the gist of it. In order to simulate quantum mechanics, you need quantum mechanics. You cannot use classical resources in a feasible fashion to simulate quantum mechanics. In the 20th century, we saw two revolutions take place. There were many revolutions in science, but two of them were extremely important. One is the revolution in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was born. That's a new paradigm. It's a revolutionary shift from classical thinking. It's not only neoclassical, it's not only post-classical, it's actually an altogether a different way of thinking about the universe. That was really a revolution. Nothing like quantum mechanics was known to mankind before the 20th century. The second revolution which has taken place is in the area of information and computer science. In the 1940s, Shannon talked about the quantification of information. We are always sharing information, but how do we quantify it? If we would like to share information, if I would like to send out a message to you, Say, I'm saying, hello, how are you? Then this requires a certain, certain piece of information. And it requires resources, it requires an alphabet. It requires consciousness. It requires my uh, locutory organs, which enable me to speak. It requires my tonsils, it requires muscle removal. So it requires certain physical resources. So how many resources are needed to actually convey a piece of information Shannon, for the first time, quantified it. And then the transistor was born, which actually enabled computing. And in the late 80s or 90s, neural networks were born. And from neural networks emerged deep learning, machine uh, learning, artificial intelligence. So this is a revolution in computer science. So this revolution in computer science and the revolution in quantum mechanics now merged together. And they form what is called quantum information processing. Or quantum computing is just one aspect of it. You could transmit signals in a quantum fashion from one point to another. And this transmission will be secure. It would be encrypted in a fashion that no sapient being using a classical computer could actually eavesdrop, could actually steal the code. All right. Uh, modern cryptocurrencies or modern cryptographic techniques for encoding information, for example, credit card information that you share over the internet, depends upon the inability of a classical computer to find out the prime factors of a large number. So, if you were to build a quantum computer, you could actually make the modern economic system go upside down because we can find the prime factors of a large number using a quantum computer. So everything will be at stake. I just want to emphasize, sorry I'm being highly charged here, I just want to emphasize that this area of quantum computing has the ability to transform the way we operate as human beings and we operate as human civilization. If you would like to do molecular simulation, you would like to simulate certain quantum mechanical systems, you would like to design new drugs for example, now the interaction of, of the molecule of a drug with an antibody is a complex quantum mechanical interaction. We cannot use a classical computer to model this. The resources needed will be infeasible. So you, you would simulate this with a quantum computer. Instead of spending trillions of dollars on synthesizing a drug and then testing its efficacy, you could actually do everything in silico, on a computer, on a quantum computer and predict the properties of the drug and whether the drug will be efficacious or not. If you would like to predict next week's weather, for example, which is a highly complex system, no classical computer can actually do it with precision. You need some other thinking mechanism, some other algorithm, some other kind of hardware. You would like to do optimal sequencing, sampling, etc. With, if you would like to put more information into your computer, you would have to come up with devices that are resistant to heat. So there are certain fundamental limitations on these classical computers and quantum computers actually 
have the ability to circumvent these problems and pro they provide a fresh way of thinking about the universe. So now I'm going to use the concepts that we built in the first four or five lectures to understand quantum information processing. So this field was just to actually motivate you. So let's move back to the blackboard. By the way, you have to come to the classroom. These videos are not a substitute to the atmosphere you would like to build inside the classroom. So generally our computers work on Boolean logic. You have a zero as one state and one as another state. Correct? So, now these states are physically achieved. For example, you can have a charge on a capacitor. If you have a capacitor and there's charge on the capacitor, you can call it state one. And if the capacitor is uncharged, it's drained, you can call it state zero. So you must have some physical realization of the zero and one. All right? And a, and a capacitor can either be charged or it can be discharged. So it could either be in 0 or 1. There is a mutual exclusivity between 0 and 1. There is an either or relationship. However, quantum mechanics, as we all know, is quite strange in its, in its predicament. It's, it's quite a strange undertaking. It's very counterintuitive in, in a sense, and it's probabilistic as well. And we've already, already seen in the double slit interference experiment in the double slit experiment, we have two slits and a screen and electrons or photons coming in and we observe an interference pattern. So we have two possible paths or two possible two possibilities for a photon to reach a particular point. And the wave function inside this region is a superposition of two wave functions, psi 1 and psi 2, where psi 1 corresponds to the wave function if the electron or photon were going to one slit and psi 2 if the electron were going to the other slit. So there is this randomness, this quantum uncertainty within quantum mechanics. It gives you two possibilities. So it creates a superposition inside this region. We've already seen it in detail. And you don't observe this superposition. If you were to spy upon the superposition, it collapses. It's very fragile. So you let this superposition act. Let it run its course, and you observe the final outcome after the superposition has run its course. 
this is something we are all now familiar with. Now, in quantum mechanics, <clears throat> uh, another, uh, another thing that we've seen is, look at this wave function here. Or let's look at this wave function. This x, is this a continuous variable? Yes. It's a continuous variable, and the wave function spans all possible values of x. All right? So x is not quantized. x is a continuous variable. The wave function takes up x as an argument, and x could range from minus infinity to plus infinity. It can take up an infinite number of values. OK? So this is continuous variable quantum mechanics. But it's also possible that we work in a digital space or a discrete space. Let me give you an example. Suppose I have a device. Which is called a beam splitter. All right. I will call it BS. Now suppose a photon, light comes in. Let's not talk about photon. Light comes in. And this is a physical device. Now there are two possibilities. As the name suggests, it can either transmit light or it can reflect light. So there's a possibility that the beam of light goes straight ahead, it is transmitted, and there's a possibility that the light is reflected. Suppose it's a 50-50 beam splitter. So if an intensity of light I0 comes in, then half of it goes here, and half of it goes here. Now here you have a detector. So if I draw these D-shaped devices, it means a detector. And I have a detector here. Now if this detector is capable of measuring the intensity of light or the brightness of light, and gives you a signal proportional to the intensity, then if you have this device and light comes in, this will give some intensity, this will give some intensity, and the two will be equal. Because it's a 50-50 beam spin. All right. This experiment can be performed classically. Now let's repeat this experiment, not with a beam of light which has many photons, but just with a single photon coming into the beam spin. Find out which state 
the photon is coming out, you'll either detect state 1 or state 2. So only one of the detectors is going to click. It's an either-or relationship between D2 and D1. Now let's call this path 0. Let's call this path 1. Alright? Well, I can label a path. One of the paths I'm calling 0. The other path I'm calling 1. Since I'm talking about quantum mechanics, I would like to say that the state of the system, if this detector clicks, will be 0. And the state of the system, if this detector clicks, is going to be 1. Now these are two orthogonal possibilities. Orthogonal means, if one happens, the other doesn't. Right? Orthogonal. So since we're talking about quantum mechanics, there is another notation that we would like to introduce that was introduced by Dirac. By the famous electrical engineer Dirac. Right? So electrical engineers can do physics as well. So Dirac introduced a piece of notation and since we're talking about quantum states what he said okay let's call this state zero but let's put this inside a symbol which is a straight line followed by the label followed by this symbol this symbol is called a cat Okay, and let's put this inside the cat. Where does the word cat come from? It comes from racket. A cat, you can put anything inside this. A label inside it. This symbol is called a bra. Alright, so you can put anything inside the bra. So this is a bra, this is a cat. Alright, now, okay. Let's be attentive because if you pass, surmount this, surmount this initial hurdle, everything will going to be really easy. This label is, it's labeled zero. This is labeled one. And why have I chosen zero and one? Because it conforms to the Boolean practice of a classical computer. I could choose it anything else. I could call this alpha, I could call this beta. Doesn't matter. Now this, system uses a property of a photon and the property of the photon that we're looking at is the path of the photon, right? So the path of the photon is defining 0 or 1, the state. So I'm looking at a particular path of the photon. The photon also has other properties. Right? It has polarization as well. But here I'm looking at the path of the photon. So the path of the photon is the quantum information that I would like to massage and manipulate. And I would like to build a quantum computer that uses the path of the photon. Okay? Now all this looks fun, you're all smiling, that's good. But you'll be surprised in a minute. Now suppose I, okay, how many levels do we have here? How many labels do we have? Two. But it's a quantum system. So it's a quantum two level system that we're talking about. Such a quantum two level system is called a qubit.
Now, how is this different from a classical system? Because here you either have 0 or 1. Yes? Okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll just look at that in a, in a slightly more refined sense, okay? So this is a qubit. This is an example of a qubit. How is it different from a classical bit? This is what we're going to explore now. But this is one example of a qubit. The part of a photon as it emerges from a beam spill. Okay? It's, uh, suppose you have a Schrodinger actually dealt with quantum states in a fashion that he was, he thought that these quantum states are extremely fragile and it will never be possible to deal with a single photon or a single electron. Uh, he thought that taming these individual particles was like keeping a dinosaur in a zoo. <laughs> like a Tyrannosaurus Rex in a zoo. It's so hard to do that. But nowadays, having these individual systems, these individual electrons, photons, atoms, in a tamed fashion, in a controlled environment, is possible and that's what makes a quantum computer actually. So now this is an example of a qubit. I'll have more examples. This is a physical realization of a qubit that can be achieved to the path of a photon. Now let's build the simplest quantum computer that I can think of. Okay, out of this arrangement. Okay, and then we'll talk more about qubits and we'll go into more details. But let me give you the surprise at the very beginning. And it's no longer a surprise because you've already seen the two set interference pattern. Okay, it's no longer a surprise, hopefully. We have just one single photon coming into the experiment. This is a 50-50 beam sphere on its own. 
This is a 50-50 beam sphere on its own. So if a photon comes in, it's either reflected or transmitted. Now, which of these detectors is going to click? What's the probability, for example, that D1 clicks? One half? What's the probability that D2 clicks? Because this is a 50-50 beam sphere, and so is this. All right? However, this is not going to happen. If you perform this experiment in the laboratory, actually only one of the detector clicks, only one. The other one doesn't click at all. All right? So, so first of all, the naive response to this question is that either of these detectors is going to click. Because the 50-50 beam sphere, it either reflects or transmits. Light comes in here. It either reflects or transmits. Reflects or transmits. So there's a half probability that this detector is going to click and a half probability that this detector is going to click. But lo and behold, when you perform this experiment in the laboratory, it's only one detector that clicks. Now how do you explain that? Now one might argue is, okay, let's try to find out the part of the photon inside this apparatus. Let me finish. Don't rush. Let me finish. Let's try to find out the path of the photon. So I would like to observe here. If I observe here inside the apparatus, then the probabilities, these probabilities are restored. Either this detector clicks or this detector clicks. I get the classical scenario. It's exactly similar to the double slit interference experiment. That if I would like to find out the path of the photon, if I would like to find out the path of the photon, then this in so-called interference, if it looks like interference, it disappears. Now what's happening here is quantum computing at its best. How do we explain this? Now this path is, I define this path to be zero. I've defined this path to be 1. All right? Now, likewise, this beam sphere, now I'm going to explain this experiment. What is actually going on here? The beam sphere creates a superposition. What does this mean? If a photon comes in, I call this path ket0 and I call this path ket1. This is a qubit. This is the physical realization of a qubit of a two-level quantum system. However, the beam spinner can be arranged in this fashion as well. That is, a photon comes in here. Look at this beam sphere. The photon can come in here or it can come in like this. So there are two possibilities for the incoming photon as well. So if the photon comes in here, 
it goes like this, it can either go like this or it can go like this. So I have defined transmission to be 0, so I call this 0. I have defined deflection to be 1. I am just consistent in my labeling. All right? But there are two incoming paths as well. So I would like to label the incoming paths as well. So I like to call this path 0 and I like to call this path 1. Alright? So what a beam splitter does is that if it is fed with a photon in the state 0, if the photon is in a state tech 0, what the beam splitter does is that it creates a superposition of 0 and 1. It creates a state which is the sum of 0 and 1, the coherent sum of 0 and 1, or the superposition of 0 and 1. And I would like to divide this by a factor of 1 over under root 2. Uh, I'll explain this later, but this is due to normalization. Okay, when we talk about probabilities, I'll explain this. But it creates a superposition of 0 and 1. And there's a plus sign here. Alright? If the same beam splitter is fed in with a state cat 1, then it once again creates a superposition. It creates both of these parts at the same time. The photon in this region is in a superposition. You're not measuring it as yet, but it's in a superposition. So it creates 0, 1 over under root 2, and now the relative sign is minus 1. So this beam splitter here performs this transformation. It's like a logic gate. You know, you all know logic gates. An AND gate, an AND gate, a NOR gate. All right, I'll explain the logic gate. But let me finish this argument and I'll probably explain logic gates in the next lecture. So now, please, please, this beam splitter takes these input quantum states and creates a superposition. Now this is really important. These superpositions cannot exist classically. If you have a classical bit, you cannot have 0 and 1 at the same time. You can either have 0 or 1. You cannot have a capacitor that is charged and discharged at the same time. You cannot have a Sabi Anwar who is alive and dead at the same time. You cannot have a Schrodinger cat who is alive and dead. But quantum mechanics allows you to have this superposition of states. The only caveat is you're not measuring it. Okay? This is what happens in the double state interference experiment as well. You have both parts, both possibilities interfering with one another. And you get a final outcome. Now, if we have this transformation here, and we look at this arrangement. Let's see what's going to happen. So you have your beam splitters. You have your perfect mirrors. So your photon comes in. It's in the state 0. Now this photon can either go here or it can go here. It's reflected off here and it's reflected off here. Now there's just one photon in the system because the photon cannot actually be split. It's indivisible. So you have one photon coming into the system and this is a black box. You're not looking into the black box. You're not observing inside the black box. You have these two beam splitters separated by, by two mirrors and the lens are perfectly matched, etc. 
It's like an interferometer, and you're not looking inside the interferometer. What's going to happen is that the inside the interferometer, you're going to have a state which is a superposition of this path and this path. This path is called zero. This path is called one. So, at this point, the state is psi uh, zero. At this point, what happens is after the first beam splitter, a superposition is created. Because you have a beam splitter, and this is what the beam splitter does. It creates a superposition. So the first element in this interferometer is the creation of the su superposition so that you can do something interesting. Otherwise, it's just like a classical computer. So you create the superposition. Now what's the quantum state here? It's this. But you're not measuring it. Remember, you're not measuring it. If you were to measure it, which means you place a detector here, you will either get zero, either this detector is going to fire or this detector is going to fire. You're going to collapse the superposition. You're not going to do anything useful with, with it. This beam split is just going to act like a classical device. So you're not interfering in this part of the experiment. Now what's happening here? This is our second beam splitter. Let's see what happens here. So some ghostly effect, if I may use that word, sorry. Some ghostly effect, some weird effect is going to happen here. Now this state is being fed into the second beam splitter. I would like to see how this state is transformed by the second beam splitter. Now the input is a superposition. The input to this beam splitter is a superposition. So I would like to see what's going to be the output from this beam splitter. All right? Now, this is just a number, 1 over 100 to 2. If 0 is my input, what's my output? 0 plus 1, right? If 1 is my input, what's my output? 0 minus 1. So this is a 100 to 2 here, by the way, right? Plus 0 minus 1. You can, this is what a beam splitter does. If it is fed in with a state cat 1, it outputs 0 minus 1. This is the property of the beam splitter. So now if I look at this, the only assumption is that the beam splitter is acting on this state and this state which is inside the superposition. And this is true because quantum mechanics is linear. If I have a matrix M that acts on A and B, and this equals MA plus MB, this is what I'm doing. This is what I mean by linearity. Quantum mechanics is linear. So if I do this transformation, this one goes away. This becomes 0 plus 0, 2 times 0, divided by 2 is get 0 only. So the answer is get 0. So if I have two detectors here, D1 and D2, if I define this path to be get 0, and I define this path to be get 1, only this detector is going to fire. Only this detector will give me an output. The other detector is not going to give me an output. If, if I had a state only 0 here, only 0 here, only this part was populated, then both of these detectors will click. It is the superposition that enables this counterintuitive phenomenon. This is the simplest quantum computer I can think of, and we'll have more to say about this in the next lecture. Thank you.